Got it. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin special meeting and work session for Tuesday, March 1st, 2022. Rabbit, rabbit. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing for a moment of silence for those lives that have been lost over the past week since the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by Russian military forces. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, the United of, America. States of America and to the republic, the republic which, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice for, and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, and remain standing. Sorry. Thank you. Over the past two days, the Russian, Russian military at the direction of President Putin had focused their efforts on populated cities and the seat of the Ukrainian government in Kyiv, resulting in the deaths of innocent civilians, including children, as well as Ukrainian and Russian military personnel. These cruel acts of war must stop to prevent further casualties. We stand with the Ukrainian people in their fight for democracy and pray that peace is restored soon. And with that, I think we have our roll call. Okay, Council Member Fields to Wheel. Present. Council Member Minichio. Here. Council Member Meyer. Present. Council Member Feldman. Present. Supervisor Levenberg. Here I am. We're going to start with a few announcements. Uh, today is the first day of March hence my rabbit rabbit comment, and also the first day of Women's History Month. I always find inspiration in the incredible Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her life's work to advance gender equality. Justice Ginsburg frankly reminded us of what true equality looks like with her quote, when I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And I say, when there are nine, people are shocked. But there, there'd been nine men and nobody's ever raised a question about that. I'm proud to work alongside many women in our local county, state, and federal government here in Austin, now finally including our first female governor, Kathy Hochul, and first female vice president, Kamala Harris. All of the little girls out there can see themselves represented in their leaders and hopefully dream a little bigger for that reason. I look forward to sharing more resources and events as we recognize Women's History Month this March. This week also marks the two year anniversary of the first identified positive COVID-19 case in Westchester County. We have all been through so much since March, 2020. It is pretty surreal that it's actually been two years. County Executive George Latimer is hosting a virtual memorial on the Westchester County Facebook page this Thursday, March 3rd at 2 p.m. We're also going to be joining the Village and Planning in Austin commemoration in the coming weeks, Village of Austin. I'm also happy to report that Bethany Arts Community is taking the sentiment every month is Black History Month to heart with programming continuing into the month of March. On Saturday, March 5th at 7 p.m., there will be a DJ battle. Then on Saturday, March 12th, the Austin NAACP Youth Council will be hosting a talent and fashion show at Bethany. On March 19th, there will also be a Ladies of Hip Hop public show and show and tell at 8 p.m., I guess also commemorating Women's History Month. All of these events are taking place at Bethany Arts Community right here in Austin. And you can learn more and register at www.bethanyarts.org slash black-history-month-2022. The Bethany Arts Community Exhibit, Austin Black History and Culture, Resilience, Dedication, Excellence will also continue to run through March 12th. Um, I had the opportunity to check it out with Councilwoman Feldman shortly after it opened, and I strongly encourage you to do so as well. And I'm sure it's even gotten better since we were there. Huge, huge shout out to Village Historian Joyce Sherrock Cole for curating this fantastic showcase of Austin's incredible history. The Village of Austin is kicking off the Downtown Revitalization Initiative process with a public meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, March 8th, from 6 to 8 p.m. 
Ossian is slated to receive $10 million in grant funding through the DRI, so make sure your voice is heard in this process. Join the meeting by visiting bit.ly at Ossian DRI at the time of the meeting. The Village also has posted information regarding this funding on their website if you would like to learn more now. The Austin Recreation Department has a few fun activities scheduled for kids this week and next, starting with a night out for children with disabilities and their caregivers with a splash. From 6 to 8 p.m. on Friday, March 4th, this program will include pool time, so make sure to bring your and your child's swimsuit and towel. The program is free, but you must register at villageofostening.org. Next Friday, March 11th, there will be a kids' night out for those in kindergarten through grade six, starting at 6 p.m. The fee for this program is $12 for the first child and $10 per sibling. Make sure to register in advance. The Green Austin Repair Cafe is back next Sunday, March 12th, from 11 to 3 p.m. at the Community Center. And it's so nice to be advertised all these in-person things that are back. Bring your broken but beloved items and have them fixed for free from tech support to broken furniture and even your bikes. Thank you to Green Austin and program sponsors First Village Coffee and Melrose Lumber for organizing these events. And that is it for my announcements. Do any of my board colleagues have anything else to add? Nope. All right. Hearing none, I guess we will get into our special meeting resolution. Okay. Contract Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce Incorporated resolved that the town and board of the town of Austin authorizes a supervisor to sign an agreement with the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce Incorporated for the administration of the 2022 Food Truck Fridays events and marketing of 2022 summer events to include Food Truck Fridays and summer concert series and fireworks celebration for Independence Day, subject to approval by councils of the town as to form. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We are very much looking forward to summer 2022 for another great year of Food Truck Fridays, very popular last year, and our summer concert series. And we thank the Chamber of Commerce for working with us on this contract and look forward to um, a wonderful summer. We can't wait. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Thanks. And can I have a motion to adjourn to work session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? <clears throat> So um, first up on our work session this evening, uh, we have a departmental report from our town clerk, the Honorable Suzanne Donnelly. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is the first time I'm seeing Jan at the meeting. And well, Angelo, I've seen it at a few meetings. So welcome, everybody. And uh, this is the clerk. Uh, the clerk's office is the epicenter for the town and village in town and village hall with no residents, business owners, or visitors to our community permitted on the second or third floor. We have welcomed many departments into our space. <clears throat> we, have a we have had the, tax, the town tax office during their collection periods, as well as a few from the assessor's office in the newly redesigned McKinley room. Initially done because of COVID, we truly believe the better configuration for both our staff and our visitors works very well. A new elevator has been ordered uh, with the lag time for this special elevator it could be months uh, without this convenience. I apologize because I'm always gonna be looking at you because my screen freezes up, but I'm not going to the office. So. <laughs> As we move into the world without masks, hopefully no new variants, we have posted signs in our office that we will continue to wear masks to the counter. This is for our protection as well as our visitors as we slowly move into a non-pandemic world. As you are aware, we have moved all applications for peddlers, alarms, cabaret, dog licensing, vital records, to name just a few, bees and foils, uh, to uh, just name most of the town applications online with great success. 
Most of the residents use the online system easily with some needing some training and others, usually our older residents, needing additional help that may require a visit to the office. This has allowed us to stay on top of all requests as they come in and they're answered in a very timely manner with, every, with every, each member of our staff taking their responsibility extremely seriously and especially since we run in the busy office with two and a half people. We have mastered cross training so that what is needed, someone needs to step up, they can take on the responsibilities of another. Some updates on the responsibilities of the town. While we are the taxi authority for the village, we're gonna talk about taxis for a few minutes. While we are the taxi authority for the village, there is a part in our town function. Working with the senior nutrition program, they have a, the senior, the town senior coupons are sold at a discount price for seniors 70 years and older. In the past, there were select companies that could use this, be used for this program. With the reduced number of taxi companies and several issues with the select companies, we have opened up the program to all 14 companies requiring them to sign contracts and to read the sexual harassment policy. We have also issued a flyer to each senior detailing the programming and giving them my contact information that should they run into any issues. Every driver who was spoken to during their application period and our relationship with the police as our partners have allowed us to react quickly with any issues or problems. And I'm happy to say that besides people not wanting to go out to the town to pick people up, we had one or two of those incidences, it seems to be working much better than it had in the last year or so. We will see, but we stay on top of it. And um, as the taxi maven, I drive around town wiggling my finger at people. Dog licensing continues to grow, especially since we did the census. Between 6-1-2020 and March 2021, we had 146 dog renewals and 89 new dogs. Then we started to do the program. During the months of between June 1st, uh, 21 and March 1st, 22, we, when we did the census out, we got an additional 490 new do dogs and 128 renewals. This spring will be the first year that the renewal process will be in full effect. I know it seems like it's taken a couple of years for it to kick in, but to make sure because people were home with their dogs and stuff like that. I just wanna point out that Briarcliff had a very successful dog census with us too. They were very happy with their results and they took part in it because they do their own. The village of Austin, as you know, does not have a dog program. They do everything through the town. So not only did Briarcliff have success, but other communities have requested the information and we are following our example. It's not our example, we didn't make it up. We borrowed it from somebody else who borrowed it from somebody else. So it works out very well. The Alarms in the in un Unincorporated Area is a wonderful program that was done by the building department for years and we took it over last year. It's much more successful in the town than it is in the village right now. So we're gonna be working on the village alarm program too. The follow through on the building department has made it such a success. And we also have a good relationship where um, the police, especially Patty at the, the chief's office, sends us a list of people that had false alarms or alarms. Um, and then we they are sent up to be invoiced by the um, by the finance office. Cabaret license in the town. My, I wanna just go over, Maya Riviera has their license. We're waiting for a reinspection of the Briarcliff Manor. And we have sent emails out to Flames, the Briars, Tara Rustica and Club Fit. We have not heard from them, so but they are they have been officially notified that they must have a cabaret license to have music in their establishments. We think that was important. As you know, we are also the, where everyone sends their foils in. We have two separate programs, one for the village, one for the town. Uh, we are responsible for set, accepting the foils, which we have requested and seriously pushed that people do them as online foils. 
Uh, it helps them because the accuracy is much better. It helps us because it's a whole program where we are very strict on certain days that we have in the department. And it's great for the departments because they get the information fast, they get it in a timely manner, and they have time to react to it and answer the FOIL um, the way it should be. We also take care of all vital records, births, marriages, and deaths. I wanted to go in order that one lives. <laughs> Uh, as you know, we do not have a hospital in Austin, so the only births that we have are home births, which I kind of expected a few more to be during the height of COVID, but we did not get them. Um, and we also, uh, and also when we get birth requests, there are 90% of those go to the village of Austin because they would have to be before 1955 when Austin Hospital closed. So if you were born before 1955 in Austin, you were born usually at Austin Hospital, which is a village. Uh, it's in the, it was in the village. It's where Star Bethlehem was, if anybody's interested. Uh, marriages and marriage records are completed online, so their applications take less time in the office, and they come in to finalize their marriage license. They're in there for five minutes. They've examined their, uh, their draft marriage license. They make sure all the things are corrected. No one's yelling their personal information over a wall. And uh, we have gotten great success over that. We were uh, very successful during COVID because we didn't see any reason to shut down our marriage licenses because people want to get married. And, it isn't that difficult. So what we did was we opened it up and we got a lot of people from New York City, they come up, get their license and we get the license back in the mail after their marriage ceremony. Uh, death certificates and records are our responsibility. As you know, unfortunately right now we're going as of five o'clock tonight, we go into one week without our electronic death certificate uh, mechanism with the state, they're switching over. And that will cause us any, if we have any deaths during that time, again, we don't have a hospital. Um, it will be quite tedious to do those death certificates, but we'll really appreciate our electronic system when it comes back. We also, uh, because we have our part-timer as her responsibility is to take everything that comes in offline and find it and research it and do it. That's why everyone gets their responses back very, very quickly. And, and I can't thank Martha and Janet enough. They are excellent, excellent employees and we're such a team down there. And we have finance down there most of the, well, all the time, but uh, so it's really good down there. Other areas that we cover are elections. And I almost forgot to put bees in there, but bees for the town. And we have two, uh, we have, uh, Bethany has got their bee permit St. Augustine's just has to finish a map and um, local residents have not reacted to that, but we'll leave that up to the building department to go out if people have bees and they have not registered their bee thing. Uh, as you know, uh, if you don't know, if you've called the office, 90% of the time the calls seem to come through us. I'm not quite sure why. And we redirect the call. So we're kind of the switchboard for the office. And we also take care of claims, uh, uh, notices of claim, or however one wants to refer to it. They're not really referred to as notices of claim anymore. If somebody has something happened to them, uh, I hope uh, I, you understand that the clerk has to go back and research whether this has happened before, whether they've gotten prior notice, and uh, all this work is done in the office. So that's a quick snapshot of what we do every day. Some of the things that are coming up, we have the St. Augustine's Fair. I do want to talk to you, Victoria, about that, you know, how we want to handle the St. Augustine. It's a four-day fair this year. Um, when is it? It's in, it's in July. It's where it usually is, but I think they're only doing, I think they added on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and possibly Sunday, I'm not sure, but uh, because last year it got, was too crowded. Remember, they only had it like two or three days and it was mobbed there. Um, and we'll have to do, we do peddlers for the uh, town too. And the only peddlers license we have right now out is the hot dog man on the intersection of 134 and 9A. Um, I have seen some um, guys going around selling solar paneling or uh, construction or 
electricity and I've had, I've stopped the car and said, you don't have peddlers permits. You cannot be out doing that stuff. So we're going to put a little push on that in the next quarter. But other than that, we just keep moving along. Every day is a unique situation in there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, but we're all working together. So that's the, that's the clerk's office in a nutshell. And we appreciate Any all questions? that. Good Any questions from my Any questions? Board? I have just a quick oh. question. I missed what you said. You said St. Augustine is going to be in July, but did you have the dates or no? I don't have the dates right this second. Oh. No, I, I saw it posted somewhere. It's not that they've called or they sent in their paperwork because they have to have certain paperwork for whatever games of chance that they have and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but yeah. Thank you. All right. So any other questions? No. Nope. Thank you, Sue. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so um, next, uh, thank, Sue, thank you so much. I re very much appreciate the time. You're very welcome. The overview. Um, again, it's always good, especially now that we have a couple new um, town council yeah. members this year. Um, so we appreciate it. And um, I'm sure that, you know, if they have any questions, they know where to go with any of those. Always welcome. Great. Always welcome to come in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Um, bye. Thank you. Um, okay, so and next up, we were going to um, be talking about our comp plan um, and a couple of other things, but we're waiting. Uh, we don't yet have um, Valerie or Chris Race. They're supposed to join us at eight o'clock. So I'm wondering if we can instead move up climate smart communities. Can we do that, Victoria? That is perfectly fine. Wonderful. Let's talk. Let's talk okay. about smart communities. And you're going to give us a little bit of an update. Um, you've been working with Maddie Zahach from the village manager's office and Susie Ross of Green Austin to establish a joint climate smart communities task force for the town and village to help us achieve bronze level certification under this program. Establishing this task force does require the town board to adopt a resolution. And I'm hoping you're going to discuss the importance of the program with the town board now and the proposed resolution. Yes, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly and pull up a couple of um, web pages about the program. Can everybody see my screen? Oh, but why? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. It's I can't see what I want to see. Okay. Um, so I pulled up here. This is the website for the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation's Climate Smart Communities Program. Um, and essentially, I think the, the easiest way to explain it is Climate Smart Communities is a little bit of a bragging rights um, program where you um, go through certain actions and um, submit certification documents for those actions and they're all relating to um, you know sustainability and uh, reduction of greenhouse gases and all sorts of different important things uh, for being a climate smart community um, and as you complete actions and you submit certification to the state you can earn bronze level certification silver level um, as you can see here from this map there are 353 registered communities the town of Austin is a registered community but we are unfortunately not one of the um, 72 bronze certified communities or one of the eight silver certified communities. Um, so I had circulated to uh, the, and posted to the Google Drive um, on Friday that um, it's, you know, this is a really great program. It opens us up to opportunities for grant funding. We have received grant funding through this program before, um, and it's just a really great um, opportunity to showcase all of the important environmental work that we're doing. Um, and one of the actions, which is mandatory for bronze and uh, mandatory for being silver level certification is to establish a climate smart communities task force. Um, and I think the most important thing is for, you know, here in Austin, we really have done a lot of great work and, you know, I've been like, uh, like the supervisor said, I've been working with Maddie and Susie, and, you know, we've gone through this list of all the different certification actions. And as we go through it, I mean, I think we probably could earn the highest level certification they could give because we do so much great stuff here in Austin relating to sustainability. But the most important thing is you need to pull all your documents together and show the state that you're doing these items and there are certain required things that you need to report back to the state to earn certification. Um, so we are hoping to establish a joint climate smart communities task force, um, which would be responsible first to help us 
gather all that documentation, show that we're doing repair cafes and we advertise it on Facebook and we have this awesome Earth Day festival and we have EVs in our um, town fleet, town and village fleets and in our parks and all of this great work. It's just about compiling the documentation and we're hoping that with a focused group, this task force working together, we can accomplish that and um, you know really work together to get this, this job done and make sure that we're getting the recognition that we deserve for all of our great, um, great work. Um, so again, uh, we do have to adopt a resolution to establish the task force, which I did share a draft, which is right here, um, essentially saying that, uh, you know, this is a really important program. We did um, become registered communities and adopt the pledge in 2009 when the program started. We've also been involved in the Cure 100 program. Um, here in the town, we had actually previously identified, um, you can identify an existing um, entity as your task force. So we had identified the Green Austin Committee as our task force a couple of years ago. Um, but what we want to do now is have a standalone uh, task force that's really dedicated to just earning Climate Smart Communities certification. Um, and what I've discussed with Maddie and Susie um, and what we're proposing to the town board and also the village board is that this task force is comprised of not less than one member of both boards, um, as well as a representation from each of our planning boards, because there are a lot of um, items relating to planning related initiatives, members of our Environmental Advisory Council, and um, both environmental advisory councils, and then also members of Green Austining, and Maddie and I would serve as joint coordinators of um, the task force. Um, so I just wanted to share this with the board. I'm going to stop sharing so we can kind of look at each other and talk about this for a minute. Um, but it's a really important thing, and I think it would be really helpful to us to kind of work together as a team with Green Austining and the village to help us earn this recognition and, um, you know, be able to kind of showcase all of the great work that we're doing. Um, and also, I just want to note too, you know, obviously the program, this Climate Smart Communities program is always growing. It's been growing since 2009. So I think once we do earn bronze level certification and eventually move up to silver and whatever other levels that they offer as part of this program, you know, right now we're really hoping that the task force can help us with some of the more mundane parts of this work, the pulling together all of the different documents that they need to see and all the proof to show that we, we did all of these programs. But I think in the future, this can kind of shift to um, a, a task force that is, uh, keeping tabs on what this program offers at the state level may recommend to the town and village board some future actions to continue to earn points as part of this program, continue to participate in this program, perhaps apply for grants as part of this program in the future as well. Um, so I think it can kind of evolve as it goes along with the immediate goal of trying to earn us certification. Um, that's fantastic. And, um, you know, many, many of you may have heard you know about the clean energy communities it's a little confusing because there's a lot of acronyms and they're all related to this um you know the various efforts that the state is trying to um, offer incentives for um, so that communities will uh, participate whether it's um, grant dollars that come as a result of you taking certain actions um or uh, grant dollars that are involved in the actual actions themselves, helping again to to establish um, uh, electric vehicle charging stations or um, green building or New York stretch things like that. All, so many of the things that we've already done, the um, community choice aggregation, uh, you know, which is again paying dividends now that we see Con Ed um, rates going up, all of the different things that actions that we've already taken. But you also have to prove that you've done those in a timely fashion and you can't always just go back and rest on your laurels. Like you have to keep moving forward. So I think that, you know, that's the big um, challenge with this program, which is why it's good to have a focused task force that's just spending time pulling together the required documents and going through and, and making sure that the actions are um, aligned with you know what needs to be done to to get to that um, bronze level first and then obviously hope hope to achieve silver at some point. I don't know if they have I, I know that they have like how many they'll let get to certain levels in different programs. I'm not sure that's true for this program. But um, it looks great. I think the resolution looks great. Um, does, does the town board have anything, any questions or comments about any of these? Go ahead, Councilman. Yeah. 
Thank you. No, very nice presentation, Victoria. Very thorough. Just wanted to know, um, is there any cost associated with being part of this and setting all this up? I mean, on our end, or is it strictly just receiving these uh, credits and all that? Nope, it's just about receiving the, you know, receiving receiving the points and the certification. We've actually earned, uh, we've actually received grant funding through this program. So, um, and this is kind of a good segue into our next topic about the comprehensive plan. The funding that we received to help fund our comprehensive plan was actually through the Climate Smart Communities Program. And when we adopt the comprehensive plan, because the comprehensive plan has sustainability elements, it's focused on sustainability. We are going to earn points as part of the program by adopting the comprehensive plan. So that's one example of these these sorts of actions that we're looking to document and earn certification on. So there isn't really a, 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 any direct cost other than the costs associated with accomplishing those things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like we have to pay anything to the state or to the folks involved to to uh, accomplish uh, certification. Or in, Good. Internal, internal costs. Yeah, right. Just Good. I think it's a great idea. Great. Other questions? No, I, I think it's great. I think working in conjunction with the village, you know, the greener uh, sitting as a whole is the better, you know, invite Briarcliff. I mean, hey, see if we can't all do it. But, you know, I, I yeah, think Briarcliff is a little bit be further behind, I think, in some of these areas, but hopefully yeah. um, they well, have a I, manager who's a little more focused on this. So it is a good idea that we, you know, we definitely could reach out to them and see if they um, want to participate. And I also think that, you know, one of the reasons why we want to work together and work with Green Austin is that some of these actions are um, more community focused. So, for example, the repair cafe, having a repair cafe is also something you can earn points on. And a lot of those initiatives have been um, you know, sort of championed by Green Austin on behalf of both the town and the village. So it's important that we, yeah. we do work together on these on these things because it's not necessarily exclusively town, exclusively village. It's something that we've worked together as a community. And it's silly to duplicate the work. Strategy. Yeah, I'm guessing also the food scrap recycling is also. We we um, have done, we, we have a very oh. impressive tally. It's just going to be <laughs> pulling together all the things they want to see. So should be good. Awesome. All right. Is there any further discussion on, on the um, CSC? No? No, okay. happy to continue on this path. Again, glad that we have such a supportive board who understands the importance of focusing on environmental improvements. That's, we have to just keep, keep chipping away and we really can do a lot at the local level. So I'm very appreciative uh, for all the support that we get. Um, okay, so next up, um, we have our special guests here with us, uh, Chris Race from WXY and Valerie Minostra from Nelson Pope and Voorhees to discuss some of the feedback that we've received on the comprehensive plan thus far, some recommended tweaks to the plan to incorporate some of the feedback and to give the board an opportunity to discuss the plan uh, during work session. Uh, remember, anyone can still provide feedback on the comp plan via the project website, which is sustainableostening.com. And we will be opening the public hearing on the plan at our next legislative session, which is Tuesday, March 8th. So we still quite a lot of time is available to provide comment on this important document. I'm going to turn it over to Chris um, so you can share with us what we've heard so far and maybe some suggested um, tweaks that we are considering. Great. Thank you, Dana. Well, nice to see all of you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give a sort of update, sort of work in progress in terms of what we've heard back. Um, right now, we're collecting feedback, as Dana said, through a Google form on the website. Um, we've received around four comments from that thus far. Um, and obviously we took notes from the comments we received at the town hall, town board presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's a couple of themes emerging or so, sort of coalescing around a few ideas. So I did wanna share my screen for a moment, just to give you a sense of what we're hearing. So there have been quite a few comments around noise pollution um, related to both roads and train stations. Um, and so we did want to acknowledge that and try to draft recommendation that speaks to the to noise pollution, recognizing that a lot of that falls outside of your jurisdiction. Um, so again, this is sort of work in progress draft, but we have this recommendation that we'd like to add, sort of advocate and work with local state and federal agencies to reduce noise pollution 
or sounds that interfere with everyday activities such as sleeping, conversation, or disrupt or dis dis <laughs> diminish one's quality of life. Um, and sort of we pulled some of this, this language from sort of like federal policy related to just noise pollution related to environmental sustainability. sustainability. Um, so that's sort of a draft work in progress. And any, any initial questions or comments on sort of thoughts on noise pollution? I mean, I would just say that, you know, this is obviously um, something that we take very seriously and we care greatly about. Um, it's certainly something that has been difficult for us um, to kind of figure out a solution to um, because we are to a certain extent at the mercy of outside agencies and outside forces, um, but we are working hard to address some concerns that we have heard, serious concerns that we've heard from neighbors in Crotonville um, and, and surrounding areas um, that seem to be stemming from uh, Metro North, possibly also from 9A and um, trying to, um, you know, again, figure out how that is very important to quality of life and why it's so important to find a, a way to, to um, include that in the comprehensive plan was um, an out, a suggestion that we got from our community residents and we're appreciative of that. And thank you for the suggestion of uh, the language. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. I, I think, I mean, to me that it does work because it, it kind of, you know, it sort of puts it out there that it's important. Right. Yeah, acknowledgement, definitely. Um, great. Um, and then another- Is the town board, anybody else have anything, anything that they wanted to say about that? Not right now. I mean, we obviously have to finish figuring out where all that's coming from. All right. Happy to come back to that if there are further questions. Um, another one that we heard feedback on, especially at the presentation a couple of weeks ago, was a recommendation on the housing um, preservation and development section that relates to something called missing middle housing. Um, now we'll take a moment to explain what that is just a little bit further. Um, but essentially missing middle housing is a housing typology that looks very similar to, it actually looks exactly like a single family detached home, but it can contain multiple units, um, and I've pulled a couple of a couple definitions, one from the Congress for New Urbanism. You can see here, missing middle is a range of multi-unit or clustered housing types, um, compatible in scale with single family homes that help meet the growing demand for walkable urban living. That's, that's sort of one definition. Another one um, from missingmiddlehousing.com, which is sort of a group of urbanists that have kind of generated this idea Similar, similar definition, it's a range of housing scale, house scale buildings and multiple units compatible in scale um, and form with attached single family homes. Um, so the current recommend, now I can pull up some images so you have a sense of what that sort of looks like too, if that's helpful. Um, but the current language around this recommendation says consider expanding zoning to allow for missing middle housing in which a single family home regular in appearance might, might be divided into several units for two or four, fam four families. I think there was some concern or confusion from community members that this is being suggested specifically for what is your current single family resident zone. Um, and that's not what we were trying to suggest. Um, really suggesting that the town could potentially explore this idea. So we've changed the language to, as a potential update to identify, uh, uh, yeah, this should be identify, excuse me. Um, identify appropriate zoning districts to consider missing mill housing or house scale buildings with multiple units. Um, and just so you have a sense of where this is coming from, this sort of meets a few of the issues that were raised um, during the process. We definitely heard loud and clear from community members that people wanted to maintain the sort of character of the town of Austining when it comes to housing. Um, but there was also demand for a, a wider range of, of units of housing types and also more affordable housing. And so this sort of meets in the middle of those ideas. It sort of matches the current character of the town but also does provide more units, more affordability. Um, so that's why we're suggesting that the town, or that's sort of where that comes from, the genesis of that idea. Uh, but this, this recommendation, the updated language is really just about identifying appropriate zoning districts to think about applying this. It's not suggesting its application in any specific zoning district. Um, 
I think that's a good clarification. And uh, again, I think, you know, again, it came out of hearing from people that they don't want to just see large um, apartment developments or, um, you know, large properties um, get, you know, sort of overbuilt. So a potential solution is finding ways to maintain characteristics of single family home neighborhoods. Um, but, you know, look at, again, finding um, different types of solutions to um, increasing um, housing type and also housing um, affordability and offering more housing does that. <laughs> so, um, you know, not, not specifically and, and directly, but increasing supply obviously um, makes it easier for things to be more affordable. Um, so thank so you, would it, um, Chris, for the picture, if you want to just describe that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is a diagram that shows a sort of, there's a really big range of what can be considered missing middle housing. So here on the left side, you see what is a sort of traditional detached single family home. Um, and then you can sort of see the range of what falls within mi missing middle housing, you know, things as things such as duplexes, cottage courts, fourplexes, townhomes are sort of increasing in density and size. As you move to the right, you start to get to more multiplex, larger multifamily units. Um, again, I'm not, I don't think the recommendation is trying to be prescriptive. It's more about identifying what would be appropriate for the town and then considering the right places to, to consider adding that. So I think, you know, mostly what we've been thinking about when we think about missing middle missing middle housing in this context is sort of things like a duplex, um, a triplex maybe. Um, but yeah, so it increases from sort of scale and density um, as you move from left to right. Okay, so a duplex meaning kind of more like a single family home with spacing between it, with a lawn between it, not like a whole attached building. It, it could be a single family, like what looks like a single family home with two units. So maybe there's a unit on the first floor and a unit on the second floor, but in sort of scale and size, it looks the same as your neighbor, which is just one, a single family home with, which is just one house. So the suggestion is to kind of keep it to the size of the homes in the neighborhood, um, not have a big attached, you know, like the condominiums. It, correct. Exactly. It's a much smaller scale um, housing typology that allows for multiple units as opposed to like a a big multifamily development. All right, because you got a big span here in this missing middle housing from, yeah, that looks not too bad to, oh my God, no. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I think we've tried to leave the recommendation more generalized because we'd want, you know, it's up to the town to decide which typology is makes the most sense. But I think, you know, from our <laughs> research and talking to community members, yeah, definitely thinking at the lower end of that, that scale. Okay, just draw a line right there. No. <laughs> um, I have a comment slash question um, because I see that you provided, you know, the exact definition of what missing middle housing is. But, you know, when you think about it, it's just like a general term. And um, I'm wondering with our communication with residents, we can use something it's a little like gives a little bit more of an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah. And also like, you know, in the back of my mind, I can't help but thinking that we just have to be really careful because there's all these complaints that I've heard over the years of, you know, illegal apartments inside houses that we don't see or know about. Um, that's why I use the quotes. Um, I'm just saying like, you know, going forward, I think we just have to be really clear in our communication, what we're talking about. Hmm. Understood, I appreciate that. Yeah, we can, we can definitely include, um, you know, some of the examples, some use some of the specific language that, it, that relate to the lower density examples like a duplex. So people do have a sense that we're not talking about, you know, cottage court or something larger, denser. Yeah, no. Any other questions on that? I think the only other note I would want to make is that we plan to include 
um, a link and definition um, to one of these definitions in the report so people have a full understanding of you know what it means. And I think that's helpful and I think the, the pictures are also helpful. Okay. How about ADUs? ADUs also fall under the category of um, missing middle housing as well. Great, thank you. And we're gonna be talking about those today. Is there any other definition that might be, don't it may, might take it down a little bit? Like this is the first middle, missing middle housing. Is there a next, uh, another term that might bring it down to our area, to the duplex less density area? Well, I think, isn't that um, kind of the exam, there's examples mm -hmm. that we can use, which is duplex, fourplex, courtyard building, cottage court, townhouse, triplex. So we can, in, in, you know, those are incorporated into the definition. But what if we want to really not look at some of those types of housing and really only want to look at one or two of them? Can we cross off the other ones? Um, I was so just, think, yeah. I was just, I was going to say, I think then we probably want to consider having a couple different, maybe adding a couple different other strategies. So for if you're really concerned about potential zone, like looking at expanding zoning to allow for this, I'm going to call quote unquote missing middle housing, but really more like duplexes, then that might be one recommendation. But then in terms of your existing um, zoning districts where you actually have allowed for um, multifamily housing, one of the concerns has been the overall scale of some of that multifamily housing. And this is where this missing middle housing concept also comes in in terms of design. So maybe you have like two different recommendations, one dealing with, you know, potential zoning changes in the future, and then one dealing with, you know, design elements for existing zoning that allows for multifamily housing. So in, so for example, like the town home might be more appropriate for some of your existing multifamily zoning districts versus the um, large scale or medium scale size apartments where it's one apartment, comp, uh, one apartment house um, that has like numerous units, like 30 units or more. I really just like to avoid the, um, pit you know, the, problem of ending up with something like Park Knowles, you know. Exactly. Without, you know, like I right, really- Right, right, so, right. So I think a do, like, so for example, in, in Park Knowles, I think you might, you might be willing to open and consider like the cottage court or the townhouse or the triplex, because that those would still be smaller in scale to what is, you know, right now in Park Knowles. Versus if you took a, and I'm not saying any particular area, but if you just decided you wanted to allow for other, something other than single family housing in a particular area, like, you know, just like you did with the ADUs, which allows those additional dwelling units, then your duplex is more in characteristic with that type of design. So there, so I think we were, I think the approach with this particular um, recommendation was to kind of incorporate both your existing zoning and then potential zoning down the line, which is why it's more general, but we could kind of separate the two if this board I thinks think that would be more the, appropriate. I think that's the best way to go about it is to have it separated out. Um, again, like this, this is, this, ha this all has to be really, really clear and defined. Yeah. And, um, we have to, you know, to, to me, I just feel like um, the communication has to be really clear too. That's why I said, you know, I, and I know this is the term used by, um, uh, what does it say, Congress for New Urbanism, um, but, you know, the missing middle is just too vague to me. And um, even though we're learning about it, we're reading this now, but, you know, communicating to the public, I would be more comfortable just being a little bit more detailed and clear. And um, also, as Liz said too, um, really scaling it to like, you know, out of these categories that you're showing the examples, you know, what we think is 
more appropriate um, <clears throat> where that list was. So I just think that we need to be careful not to box ourselves into a corner. Um, you know, right. I understand that we are reacting um, to, you know, push back against one or two particular developments. But I also think that we have to think about the big picture and we have to think about, you know, what is um, what we're hearing, you know, in a, in, in a, in a, you know, we're, we don't, we're not in a vacuum. We don't live in, you know, here all by ourselves. This, this, these are communities, people maybe who don't live here, who want to live here are potential new community members at some point. And, you know, how we live today is changing. Um, we are all very, um, you know, very um, tied to a certain vision of what is, you know, the, the American dream. And it looks a lot like these single family homes. Um, or, you know, maybe, I mean, in your case, it looks like a condominium, but, um, you know, there's different types of housing that um, meet different needs. And I think that for us to start boxing ourselves into a corner and say, we're only going to have, you know, this type of housing, because people don't like this type of housing, really puts us into a very, you know, small corner, um, as we try to think about, you know, making this a livable community for the future. So I, th I, I agree think with you need yeah. to be careful about saying we're never going to have this and we're never going to have that because we don't know some, something may be right and it might be correct to think about citing a triplex someplace or it might be right to think about, you know, townhouses. I mean, I, that's what, you know, that's what our condominiums are. And to say that we're never going to build any more of those. I mean, I still regret moving into a single family home, honestly, from when I moved up from the city, because it would have been so much better of a transition. Um, and maybe I would have, I still would live in a, in a, in a condominium where I had a built-in community and I could walk around and take my dogs out and not that I have any dogs, but I would have had dogs if I lived in a condominium. So again, I think that, you know, looking at different types of housing, missing middle is, is, a, is a sort of an um, emerging term, I think, that's um, being used to think about how can we develop our communities in a way that still maintains characteristics I'm not going to say character because I don't like that word. I think it's loaded. That maintains characteristics of the things that we think of as the, as the you know, again, the, the, um, the American dream, but acknowledges the fact that we need to have different opportunities for young people to live, different, play, different opportunities of types of housing for old people to age in place, a f a housing that we can all afford. I mean, we all know that taxes are very, very high here. And when you start looking at, you know, adding some housing stock and adding different types of housing, you can start to reduce that by adding supply again. And, you know, again, then, you know, the supply and demand actually works. And then you start seeing um, where, you know, numbers start coming down and a bigger pie be everybody has a smaller piece of a bigger pie, right? So again, I, I think you know you need to be careful and not just be reactionary to you know to to things that we hear from some. And also remember the people who are fighting for what just to maintain what we have right now are the people who live here right now. The people who want to move here they can't fight to be here, and we can't just pull up the ladder as my old. Um, friend, my friend and, and former council member, uh, Karen DeTore used to say, um, ju just when we get here, we can't just pull up the ladder and say, nobody else can come here. This is a great community. We want it to be available to people to move into um, from all different types of um, you know, levels of affordability and different types of uh, people who want to move here. And you know, just like we did um, introduce um, ex you know, um, accessory dwelling unit legislation a few years ago so that it would make it easier for people to age in place and they may be able to convert a, a garage or a basement or something like that into an apartment for maybe a mother-in-law, maybe maybe a kid, maybe their, their kids, maybe um, you know somebody else coming in, a college student or something like that. Like these are opportunities for people to, make, to continue to, to live in their, in their homes and also have an opportunity for some outside income and also have offer an opportunity for somebody else who's looking for um, some type of affordable housing um, situation that might be better than what they could get elsewhere. So like, let's keep our minds open here. Let's not shut down progress in Austin. I, I don't think that's a good idea. All right. Well, I mean, I'm talking about 
making sure that, well, I think the community is heard, but also making sure that things fit we are what the intention of the zoning is. So, I mean, Park Knowles doesn't fit the area. I don't think that when the board who changed that zoning, um, when it was in multifamily envisioned what it became. And I think there were loopholes that they had not thought of what the developer took advantage of. And, you know, that's not affordable by any means. Park Knowles is renting at $4,800 for a one bedroom with a with a loft. So it's it's not affordable or and it doesn't really fit the neighborhood. So I think, you know, there's a middle ground between making sure that there can be more different types of housing available and making sure that the code is specific enough so the develop, uh, developer can't get around it um, and build something that really doesn't work for our community. So I think there's a middle ground between, you know, hey, come on in and let's just use this broad term and, you know, and saying only single family or only duplexes. I think there's a middle ground and we really have to be very specifically careful as we hear from the community on what they want, um, the community, the, what they want the Ossining to look like and in the direction they want to take. That's what a comp plan is about. It's not really about what you or I individually want. It's what the community wants, the direction they want to go. And they do understand that they want more housing and more types of housing. But I think we really need to understand and be very careful with our crafting and our coding um, so as to avoid some of the uh, mistakes of the past. Can I just respond? And that, if I can just, I'm sorry, I just want to say one more thing because I don't want to be misunderstood. I agree with Dana. We do have to think about future people coming up here. We do have to be open to all and open to all kinds of housing. Mm -hmm. But I also agree uh, that's what kind of what Liz just said kind of was what I was trying to say. Like, we just have to be really clear with our zoning and not allow loopholes. Um, and also, I don't know where it is, but there's a page that I keep seeing in the background of photos, actual photos of the different types of housing. And I just want to say that those would be very helpful going forward. Um, it's gone now, but <laughs> I saw I saw the pictures of um, yeah 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 yeah. I think those are very helpful in terms of understanding the concepts that we're talking about, so people don't feel reactionary and understand like what it really looks like. So that's it. And just I mean, it was said a couple of times, you know, just to remind everyone again. I think you all understand this. This is not the code, right? This is not the zoning. This is not the ultimate, um, the ultimate document or language that is going to result in any new developments. This is the comp plan, which is intended to be visionary and looking forward. It's intended to last for a long time, right? You know, this the, mm -hmm. the and uh, the, the town has already put over two years of time into this. It's not expected that in another two years, you're gonna go back and start from scratch or start updating it. So to Dana's point, you know, who knows what could happen over time and how trends could change and to you know, back yourself into a corner as Dana put it, or to remove even the potential of having those options, um, it, 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 could, it could end up you know, requiring more work down the line. Uh, you know, it's the town board's document. It's not my document, but I just wanna remind you that this, this is to give you the starting off point to then look at the zoning and the zoning does have to be consistent with what's in the comp plan. It doesn't mean that you have to enact zoning based upon everything that's in the comp plan. And thank you. I think, again, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make is let us not start taking things out. We're not, we're not zoning. This isn't the zoning. This is allowing the zoning to occur and then figuring out how to right size it for the community. And uh, again, the idea of missing middle housing is I think exactly to take on um, and a, you know, a different approach to um, you know, different housing types. Like, and, and again, Chris, if you just go back to the pictures again for one second, um, you know, where you see 
the live work, what does that look like? You know, that's a, a lot of communities, you know, I think actually um, Sue Donnelly, she was just on earlier and she said, everybody's moving to Myrtle Beach. Everybody's moving to Myrtle Beach. Um, and instead of moving into the single family homes where there's much too much, you know, space between, they're all going into those live, the, the, the live work spaces or they have stores on the bottom and, um, you know, a few townhouses nearby. And, you know, th these are trends that we're seeing in other, in other places, um, in the in the U.S., um, does it mean you know that we're never going to see them here, or we're never going to want them here? It's really hard to say because trends are changing in housing, and to, for us to just be um, you know again so prescriptive and, and and shut down the possibilities in the comp plan when again this is supposed to be a visionary document doesn't seem right to me. If anything, missing middle gives us options that are different from. What we're talking about, for example, with you know what Perth Knowles looks like and what uh, whether or not it was contemplated, um, that that's what it would ultimately look like. But um, you know, this is these are different options for how we can sort of walk down a path towards um, you know a different kind of housing that's not just what we all traditionally grew up with. Just because we grew up with it, just because it was developed that way, doesn't mean it was the best way to develop communities. Just because we're used to it doesn't mean that it was the best thing for us. And it, and yeah, I absolutely it. understand that, Dana, but it doesn't mean that I want to say that I want really large units of housing either. And I think we have to be careful because I don't want it to specifically say that we want to work toward, you know, all big live work things in areas or, you know, all things that look like Perth Mill. And, you know, so I think um, my point is that we need to be very specific about and, and actually listen to the community about what direction they want to go in. Right. And this is what the comp plan is. is. So, that's exactly what this exactly. is. That's what it's the a balancing is. act. It's a balancing act. Because on the one hand, people say they want more housing and they want more, they want more different types of housing and they want affordable housing. And on the other hand, they say they don't want anything except for single family homes. So this is a way right. to So we have to balance. find the middle ground. Exactly. And that's, and that's exactly what the missing middle housing is. That's what it is, is it gives you options that are different than just large apartment buildings. I understand that. Does anybody else want to say anything on the town board? Any other comments? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the flexibility, I think. You know, having dealt with the ADU issue quite a bit, you know, it, it is scary, the lack of middle income housing, uh, particularly in Westchester County. The average home price in the month of November in Westchester was over $700,000. So if you're a recent graduate, if you're an elderly person, disabled person looking to be close to family, it's just we have to do more to, to figure out our options. So the more flexibility we could have to figure this out, I'm, I'm open to it. Um, and I also just want to note, Chris, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about it, but, you know, as part of this process, we obviously did a lot of community engagement. And I know at least um, one of the exercises involved um, showing some images of different types of housing and people could kind of put their stickies next to the ones that they liked. And I think we did certainly see a lot of preference for, um, you know, some of the types of images that Chris was showing before. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Chris. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that came up a lot during <clears throat> the second the second workshop, and then as well, um, and some of the summer public boards that were out there. And I think, generally speaking, there was, I, I think people really felt like some of the smaller scale. And again, I, I would agree that just echoing sort of Christie's point that this is meant to be a long term plan this is not the actual zoning, but um, there's a lot of sort of interest and um, excitement just around some of these smaller scale um, housing typologies because, you know, they, I think people are, feel connected to the neighborhood characteristics, you know, thinking about size and scale and that these provide more flexibility um, while still sort of honoring, um, you know, the town's various characteristics. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of interest and excitement also from the steering committee as well when we talked about this in more detail. Um, you know, at this point that was seven or eight months ago, but you know, there was a lot of interest and excitement just around the idea of more flexibility and, you know, for all the points that Greg just also raised, you know, folks who are 
we have someone on the steering committee who was living in the city, you know, recently graduated and wanted to move back to, to the town. And, you know, there weren't that many housing options for them. And so we talked a lot about just having different options for different types of people in different places in their lives. And this sort of speaks to that. I mean, just some of the, you know, some of the new ones are just going for worse prices than the housing. So, I mean, we'd want them to be maybe even smaller units, you know, and, you know, stepping stones for people and not these huge, you know, apartments that are going for, you know, twice my mortgage. Right. And, and again, this, this recommendation is really about allowing the town the flexibility to explore the idea. It's not about saying, this is the, this is the exact type of miss, missing middle housing we want to place here. It's really just like, this is an idea that the town wants to explore and to take the next step. And there are different areas, right, within the town with different existing zoning um, character, right, Dana? That's the word you like? Um, no, so, I like characteristics. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Characteristics. I um, so, so, you know, what, what may be suitable for one likely won't be suitable in another area. And so that's another reason why um, to, it, gives, it does give you more options because um, to, to almost pigeonhole yourself to one type in, in all different areas may not be the, the most conducive way to, to move forward. But ultimately, you know, that's the town board's decision to make. All right. Anything else? Great. Councilman Manishio, did you have anything to add? I can't see you in the screen, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Are you good? No, I'm just going to do my homework on the missing middle housing. This is more research, that's all. And I'll get back and listen to the community. Okay, great. All right. Um, those, so those are the two big updates and changes that we've heard thus far. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to keep collecting all the feedback that we're hearing and then we'll you share, share a summary with you all if there's any, anything other um, major that comes up. All right, fantastic. And then we will have our public hearing and we'll continue to get, gather input as well. Great. Um, Valerie, did you have anything you want to add? Nope, I think, um, I think everything was covered. And I think we have a uh, general direction of where to go. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that okay. fruitful discussion. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Chris. And Valerie, I think we are keeping you on for the next part uh, to discuss the legislation about um, accessory dwelling units and yes. what was proposed at the state level. Maybe you're gonna talk a little bit about um, and also what we had added into our own town code uh, a few years back and how it might um, line up or not with what the state was hoping to achieve. Yeah, so I actually paired a little something and I'll share my screen. Um, so what I did, uh, what we did was just compare in very general terms you know, I think, um, as Dina mentioned, that there is a state legislation that was proposed um, to uh, require or basically require all communities to um, consider accessory dwelling units. Um, it's unclear at this point as to, you know, if and when this particular piece of legislation will ever come up for a full vote, but, um, but we thought it would be um, educational for the board to understand the differences uh, based upon what you already have in your zoning code versus what is being proposed at the state level. So I just, um, I'll just walk you through. Um, basically, to start off with, um, in terms of eligibility in the town of Austin, all areas zoned to single family housing uh, for single family housing are eligible for, um, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, are you? No, I'm gonna, I did that, I'm gonna wait till you're done. Oh, okay. Um, um, so uh, basically all areas zoned in town of Austin are eligible for accessory dwelling units. In New York state, it would be all areas also zoned for single family housing or multifamily residential uses or all lots with existing residential uses would be eligible for um, accessory dwelling units. 
Um, in terms of uh, creation of accessory dwelling units, um, basically the town of Austin allows for the construction of an accessory apartment within an existing family home or within an attached accessory building on a single family lot. Um, the, in the um, state legislation, it authorizes the creation of at least one uh, accessory dwelling unit per lot. So it's a little bit more flexible in terms of its location. Um, also in terms of the town of Austin, the town of Austin specifically has an accessory apartment, shall be located only in that portion of the building for which there has been a valid certificate of occupancy in place for at least two years prior to, to the application for the accessory dwelling unit. In the state legislation, there is no specific time requirement that a, an um, uh, apartment, or excuse me, a primary structure needs to be occupied prior to asking for an accessory dwelling unit. In terms of occupancy requirements, the town of Austining um, will allow, you uh, needs to be owner occupied in either the main dwelling or the accessory apartment must be owner occupied and the owner shall not rent out its own uh, dwelling unit. In the New York State um, regulations, it is proposing that a local government may require that a unit in the primary residence be owner occupied. And it's also um, suggesting that a local government may require owner -occup occupation for at least one year following the legal occupation of an accessory dwelling unit, but it is not requiring the owner occupy um, requirements such as what we have for the town of Austin. In terms of parking requirements, the town of Austin does require two spaces per dwelling unit for each dwelling unit, and it does require adequate off-street parking. In the state uh, legislation, they are not requiring any um, additional parking. And if as part of the development of that accessory dwelling unit, if you were to convert a garage, you do not have to replace those spaces that would be then no longer available for parking as part of the state legislation. In terms of design requirements, the town of Austin specifically really identifies um, certain design requirements, uh, again, to try to keep in characteristic of the single family neighborhood. Um, the lot on which an accessory apartment is proposed uh, shall be no less than the size required by the zoning district. Um, architectural treatment of the structures on the lot shall be uh, such that it really conforms to the single family character. Um, and also the floor area should be somewhere between 300 and 800 square feet, um, specifically so that it's not meant to be like a two family residence, but really just an accessory unit onto the primary uh, dwelling unit. In New York State, um, there will be existing primary residence. The total floor area of an accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 50% of the existing primary residence, but they do have caveats there unless for some reason 600 square feet or more, uh, unless for some reason the 50% does not allow for a 600 square foot apartment. Um, they also, the New York State also puts limitations on requirements that municipalities can set for ceiling height, curb levels, access, setbacks, um, and also um, in terms of location to the dimensions to the existing structure. So for, to a larger extent, there are more limitations that are put on as to what the communities can impose in terms of uh, overall character for the um, accessory dwelling units in the state legislation. Then also in terms of permitting, the town of Austin, it does require approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals because it's a special permit and a building permit would be obtained in the New York State legislation. A permit application to create an accessory dwelling unit um, is not allowed. It really is an administerial um, action and it's without uh, discretionary review or any sort of public hearing. So it's very different process than what's in the town of Austin. In terms of expiration, the town of Austin does um, have initial uh, permit uh, for one year renewals would be every two years there would be no expiration of the permits in the state law. And then also renewal permits the, in the town code, there is a requirement for prior to the issuance of any renewal um, permit, the building inspector gets to go in 
and um, inspect the dwelling unit to confirm that it is in um, it is meeting the requirements of the town law. There are no um, regulations or requirements for renewals of ADU permits in the state law. So those are just general differences um, between the town and the state. So basically, as you as you saw that this the state proposed legislation is more flexible. It's um, a lot more lenient than what the town is proposing. And that has been the concern for a lot of communities that it really does um, take away a lot of discretion that um, currently home rule allows for communities to determine for you know their zoning. And in this case would be for accessory dwelling units. If I could just interject on one thing, the parking requirements, I think you said there was none in the state legislation. Um, that's not correct. There is um, discretion given to the localities for parking if there's no overnight parking year round allowed at the residence. Yes, you, that is correct. Um, I, I did not include that because when I was looking at like, you know, basically the town of Austin, that I don't think the exceptions that are carved out would really apply to the town. Yeah. We don't because there's also an exception MVP. for with uh, no public trans. Uh, let's say it says something with uh, access to public transportation, and the town clearly has that within a certain um, the radius that they were also referring to as well. So there's a reason why I raised my hand, and that is because I um, actually participated in a briefing with Assemblyman uh, Epstein, who's carrying a bill about ADUs. And um, there's really serious concern about what this is gonna look like. The way it was explained was if your plot of land is 2000 feet, your, you know, your zoning is 2000 feet, but your house footprint is 1500 feet, you have that extra available amount of land to build upon in addition to your home. Uh, there are ADUs that are within the existing footprint of the home, but there's also the availability to expand the footprint of your home to the full capacity of your zoning. Um, and, you know, again, you know, what that looks like in our town and village is going to be <clears throat> interesting. Um, and when you just brought up transportation, um, when you're considering uh, adding it, more individuals, more residents to our area. Um, transportation, I think, might be an issue. I'm concerned about any strains on the school system and things like that. On the other hand, ADUs are positive, as Dana mentioned before, people that you know want to bring in elderly um, parents or some children that come and live at home for a long time. You know, so there's a lot of pluses and minuses, but I will just say during the briefing, it was a lot more minuses than pluses in terms of what was uh, expressed uh, and the concerns about that. We also have to think about sewers. What kind of stress is it going to be, you know, put on that? Um, so, again, this is something that we have to take a really close look at and not just, um, you know, put a check mark. Um, I just, you know, that briefing kind of like so there, there is in the legislation there are specific um, sewer requirements for the Department of Health to have to approve. Um, and as far as the footprint, you cannot expand beyond the current footprint in the state legislation, perhaps in the governor's proposal, but not in the Epstein and Parkham bill. Okay. So, right. I think I think the uh, I was just going to say I think the real issue I think it was really just to just so that this board, I mean, you have accessory dwelling units on in, within your zoning code. So there is no, we're not recommending at this point for there to be any changes to what you have. I think it's a successful program. It meets the needs of what, uh, you know, what the town, uh, uh, you know, um, why you decided to pursue the accessory dwelling unit. It does meet those goals. And, um, but I think this is really just so that for your information as to what the um, proposed uh, legislation is, you know, recommending at this point. I think one of the difficulties is that it's trying to create 
legislation for every type of community within New York. And I think that's where the difficulty comes in because each community, as you know, is unique and it has its own circumstances. And so that's where I think some of the issues are being raised by various communities because it doesn't necessarily fit their particular community. And to that point, um, uh, I know the, the Senator and the Assemblyman are working on a bill which will give a much more discretion to individual municipalities. So uh, I believe there'll be a B print on the Senate and Assembly bill to reflect that within the next couple of weeks. Um, and Councilman and Meyer, is that is that going to be sort of following that suggestion uh, that I, I had heard it coming out of Mount Kisco? I don't know if that, you know, who, where it maybe initiate, initially came from, but the idea, and I sort of mentioned it at um, some other meeting, where we're looking at like sort of the police uh, reform review board um, as a model. In other words, basically the state would say, okay, communities need to add X, X number of housing units to their, you know, to their potential, right? To the potential build out. And you need to add it, you know, in, in these types of um, zone, zoning areas, like maybe it is, you know, in single family zone areas. Um, You're muted, Dana. Sorry. So kind of like the police reform um, where every community crafts a solution, but like you're still mandated to do something. Here's what you have to do. And you come up with the way that you're going to do it. Is that like you have to, you know, add X number. Is that sort of where you're going? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the general idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it would get rid of a lot of the issues as far as, you know, things that we just went through with, with ceiling height and, and things like that are differential. Um, and give more power to the municipalities in that regard. Uh, well, but that, was, that, was assembly member Epstein's, um, that was assembly member Epstein's concern. His community is New York City and um, it's a lot of apartment buildings and, um, and other types of the dwellings. And there was a, uh, I think it was, was it Hurricane Ida? I don't know, there was definitely yeah. an intense storm and uh, because the ceilings were not high enough, people drowned. So, you know, obviously he's trying to protect his constituents and we all should can protect our constituents. Um, but I think there's a difference between like a mandate and an opt-in factor. Um, but again, this is something that I just listened to the briefing um, with the assembly member. And, um, you know, I don't know what the difference is. It, it, there's a mandate as opposed to like an opt-in so uh, choice. So just to yeah. be clear, I mean, you know, Councilman Meyer works for 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 Senator Harcum. It's his bill, so I, I'm, you know, I think he would also know about it. Yes, right. Yes. So he, he's kind of got an inside track. So yes, yeah, so, so I think I think basically the idea is what we're trying to to do on the next amendment is to let municipalities craft their own bill, but to still make sure that every municipality crafts something, because what we're seeing is less of a problem in places like Austin, but you move up to let's say. North Salem, um, and maybe they don't want to have, maybe they prefer their, their zoning to be a bit more exclusionary and uh, less. Welcoming. Although they've had ADU legislation in place forever, uh, according to uh, according to their uh, town supervisor. So yeah. just saying. No comment. I have uh, another question, kind of different tack. Um, our legislation has us and we inspect our accessory apartments and or units um, yearly or, or frequently. Uh, and this is taking that away from us. Is that really going to end up with our not having the right to inspect our accessory units? Well, I guess you don't, we don't inspect houses every year. So I think that the idea is that, you know, do you continue to, we have that in place I think to protect against illegal housing, right? Like so exactly. we, we were hoping that people wouldn't that 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 homeowners who built accessory dwellings wouldn't take advantage of um, of the legislation. Um, but I do think that you know it's a balancing act, and I'm guessing that that the reason is, and maybe again, Councilman Meyer, you can explain to us um, that the reason to not have those sorts of regular inspections is. To make it easier, not harder, for because I, I don't know if you I can't remember if you have to pay every year. Every year, it's it's a couple years, and then every three years in our legislation is that Valerie, is that what it is? Every three years, something like that. I can't. I can't so remember. You, you have it for inspections uh, need to take place every 
three years renewals uh every three years yes right so again is it it's is it making it harder to offer these types of um you know of a housing options but the the way that we have it currently crafted and the answer is yes the the way that the state legislation is crafted that is what was being proposed in the i think i guess in the in the either original Harkin bill and or the governor's um, budget budget bill. But is that your direction it's continuing to take? Well, I think again, when we call it the next amendment will allow the towns to figure out what exactly they would wanna do in those scenarios. Um, but I, I do think the, the impetus originally was to try to bring everything up to code quickly as possible with less barriers because of all the illegal Apartments, and as uh, Jen alluded to earlier, you know what we saw with Hurricane Ida in the city was there was a lot of casualties um, because they were in illegal ADUs essentially. So to bring those up and get them inspected quickly, get them up to code, and make sure everybody's living in a, in a safe place. And I also think um, you know Westchester County has some model legislation for ADUs, and if I was in a presentation some some time ago and I think that was one of the recommended things that they uh, said to not have was the recurring um, inspections for the reasons that we just discussed because it is a barrier to um, to having these sorts of housing types right so in other words you, you make sure that they're up to code at the very beginning just like you right. would any kind of house house you know anything that you build um, and then you allow it to exist. Um, and then, you know, if any changes are made, you go back and inspect again, just like you would, you know, for anything that requires additional inspections. I don't know. I kind of liked our inspections to make sure that things hadn't gotten out of hand. But. I think one of the concerns was, is putting too much, um, not pressure, but, you know, too much work on local Department of Buildings uh, employees, because um, most local Department of Building employees you know, it's, they, they have a big enough, uh, I guess, workload to begin with. And so they were concerned about that. There was also discussion about, you know, putting capital money from the mm -hmm. state given to local communities so that they could even hire more Department of Building employees, but that's not happening right now, as far as I'm concerned. And Greg, you tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, that was another part of the discussion. Yeah, so, so on that, I think the governor had proposed putting some money in to bring them up to speed. Um, she subsequently in her 30 day amendments for the budget proposals took out the money, took out the plan from the surrounding suburbs and just put it towards New York City. So that's where her proposal is at this point. I will say that I, I want to, I was up at NICOM, I don't know, a week or two ago. Um, you know, we did hear a little bit about it from some of the, um, uh, the NICOM folks, and they were talking about, you know, when California instituted this type of legislation, that they did have funding behind it and, and, and also training model legislation um, that went with it. So it made it um, easier to implement. Um, and, you know, again, I, I, I definitely did hear from other communities, you know, concerns about um, the uh, impact on building departments and staff and you know would 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 communities be able to afford it because this you know because you know if there was an explosion of adus uh, essentially um and you know there's no doubt that the that the um builders um are interested in this legislation also in addition to affordable housing advocates um so there's you know sort of two two different two different sides looking at it and um i think again finding a, a a balance and, and flexible um, approach to adding units in a in a in a safe way um, where they can where they can be most effective um, and not exclusionary is um, what we should all be um, you know hoping for working towards etc. No, I agree with that. And. Um, just for some of the newer board members information, the town board did look at this specific section of the code um, back in 2018, and there were amendments that were done um, with the input and, and discussion of John Hamilton, the building inspector, and I think um, it originally came to the town board's attention um, by John. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> currently as it stands, and you know, I haven't discussed this with him recently, but he didn't really seem to have any concerns about 
um, the frequency or the burden of the inspections on his ability to, to do his job. And one of the other things that we did um, at that time was this used to be in a separate chapter of the code and we moved it into the zoning code. Well, excuse me, the town board did for the one of the specific purposes of allowing the zoning board to grant variances in the event that someone did not comply strictly with the requirements of this section, which was not available previously. So that was one way in which the town board did give um, homeowners a little bit more flexibility in order to be able to utilize these provisions if they couldn't strictly comply with what the code said. Awesome. I just have one question. On the, when you add an apartment, right, your taxes go up. I mean, you have to go pull a permit. Is there any restrictions or caps in this bill that does that change anything or affect anything like that as far as if uh, if you have a regular home without an accessory apartment and all of a sudden you go get an accessory apartment, you get reassessed, don't you, for your property lot? Yeah. So I, in all yeah. that, I didn't see anything about that discussion. I don't think there is. Anything. There's there's nothing in the code. I mean, there's nothing in the proposed legislation for that, nor in the town. Code. I mean, the so is, you're, you're going to be taking an income and then you have to pay more because your property is worth more. Well, and also presumably you're more of a burden on the, the towns and schools and resources and really? should be paying more in taxes, you know? Right. So that, that goes unchanged then between everyone. Yeah. Okay. And, and, one, and I can also tell you that one of the other complaints about that I, that I heard was this isn't really adding affordable units because anybody could charge any, anything for those accessory dwellings, which is true. Um, but from the other perspective, <laughs> like I hear lots of things. Um, again, back to the adding more housing <laughs> increases overall supply. And when you do that, then, you know, theoretically um, prices can come down. And, you know, again, smaller, smaller units that might be an accessory dwelling unit um, might naturally just not be able to, you know, get that much money because they're not gigantic, but proportionately, theoretically, if you're in a fancy schmancy neighborhood, you know, and you have an accessory dwelling unit in your fancy schmancy garage that you don't need anymore because you now, uh, I don't know, flying around in your Jetson mobile or whatever, you don't need to park it. Um, you know, you can, uh, you could charge a lot of money for uh, somebody that lived there too. I'm just saying, I'm playing both sides of this here. So just right, so you, I think you know, all the different things that people are saying about this, you know. Right, but I think that, I think if you, because you have it as owner occupied, mm -hmm. you tend to have people that are renting, you tend to rent out to somebody that, you know, you might know, you might, maybe family, it might be somebody. So therefore maybe your kids. And so therefore you might be offering them below market value rent because of that kind of connection versus if you had like just a two family home and you bought the two family home and you commercialized and rented out both of those apartments. Yes. And, and I have made and, that argument and not everybody believes me, but yes, I agree with you. That makes a lot of sense. And I think in my um, home, <coughs> opinion, that's what in the town of Austin, anybody sort of like looking at an ADU probably for their own home is thinking about. Um, you know, either their kids or their kids' best friends or their or their parents or their or their sister or something like that. Um, and you know, we heard a lot. Like I know I heard when I went door door knocking on people's homes, like I can't afford to live here anymore. If only I could, you know, rent out my uh, basement or this or that, it would make it so much easier for me to stay in my home and till I die and whatever. I mean, you know, that's what people want, right? So this this it was um, actually an option for for people to stay in their homes. And, you know, I have a question. Um, do you think that these ADUs can turn into like Airbnbs type of thing? That's a good question. And so uh, there is the, the, the state legislation does have limitations that you cannot, you have to have rent at least a month. It is. Yeah. For 30 days. And I believe, oh. I don't think, I don't know if the town has that, Ours. but if that's yeah. something. It is right, something that we should consider. We really haven't right. we really haven't dived into um, Airbnbs at all here, and um, we haven't we haven't really received a lot of feedback about it. Um, but doesn't mean it's not something that we shouldn't um, you know 
again, we, we, I, don't, I, I don't know that I've received complaints. It's possible the building department has, but I can't say that I've received complaints about Airbnbs um, at all. Um, since I've been town supervisor, I don't know if anybody else has heard about that, um, but I have not. Um, that doesn't, again, doesn't mean that it's, it's not happening. It certainly is in other communities um, in, in, the, in the area. Um, you know, and I'm sure you know that hearing from Sandy's office. Oh, yeah. I'm all for Airbnbs, by the way. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. I was just curious if like that, that is what an ADU can look like utilized that way. But Valerie, you're saying no, because it has to have a 30 day. No, no in the state legislation. No in the state. Yeah, so, oh, okay. state you don't have res any restriction. Right. You have no restriction. Okay. 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 Well, I have looked, there's like only three to five Airbnbs and like Austin and Briarcliff. That's it. Out of all, you know, what I've seen. Anyway, thank you. All right. Anything more? All right. I think then actually the town's code does say the minimum term of rental is three months. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, something that, you know, we can always consider amending if, if so desired. Um, I think, are we done with this? Is it anybody else have anything else they want to add or further discuss for ADU about ADU legislation? Or again, I mean, you know, we can advocate for or against if we want to, we can just remain neutral and watch, watch how, how it plays out. But right now it is not in the budget bill. So it is not imminently being considered by the end of March, but that doesn't preclude it from being considered before June. Um, and I guess we will see and hear from our, uh, our state legislative uh, liaisons um, who are tapped into this issue, um, you know, where we stand with that and if it's something that we should um, be thinking about. And if there's anything that we wanna do to our own legislation, um, I think, you know, that that would, I know at one point there were different pieces that were, well, you could be grandfathered in. I, I don't know if that's still, you know, an option or not, but, you know, if there are pieces of, of it that we want to protect um, that we think are good or if that we want to change to make sure that we're ahead of the game, um, you know, then that's worthy of consideration at some point. So, you know, I think, again, um, if you have any uh, information that would be helpful, please let us know. Okay. With that, um, right. does somebody say something? Okay. With that, um, we have a late addition to the agenda for work session, which is to discuss a resolution that was recently adopted by the Village of Croton Board of Trustees to express their support for Afghan refugees. And they are specifically, um, we're supporting the Asin for Refugees program, um, which is something that we wanted to acknowledge. Um, and uh, our resolution is a little bit different. It's actually just um, expressing support for the, basically for the refugee crisis um, at, as acknowledged by our governor um, and uh, both for the Afghan refugee crisis. And then um, certainly given the current situation um, with Ukraine, we, um, adopted what Croton had offered to include references to the emerging, emerging refugee crisis in Ukraine and more broadly supporting the actions of all groups and not-for-profits in the community that assist refugees. Um, we circulated that to the board this afternoon and a proposed resolution, which we would like to add to the agenda for next week, um, but we want to just give the board an opportunity to discuss this important topic before we um, put it on for uh, adoption hopefully next week. So, um, if, you know, I, I'm happy to discuss any of the work that's been going on. I, um, you know, I have to say that I'm uh, a co-founder of Austin for Refugees, which was created specifically um, around a specific, a particular um, Afghan refugee who we knew was going to be um, coming to Austin most likely because uh, she had a relative here who was advocating for her to get out of Kabul um, during, you know, the Taliban takeover. Um, that actually happened successfully. And um, as we looked into it more, um, we found out that community sponsorship was a model that was being um, um, 
advocated for by some of the um, the settlement agencies to help resettle refugees in communities and make it easier for them to acculturate and seamlessly work into um, the community fabric. So uh, we started this organization called Austin for Refugees, but there are you know many organizations and there is one actually started at CSI, um, also helping to resettle refugee families. Um, obviously we know that this is going to continue and it was not just done, it was done because of somebody who was coming from Afghanistan, but it wasn't done exclusive for um, refugees coming from Afghanistan, we knew that there was a need and there are many communities that are participating, including Croton, Pleasantville, Briarcliff, um, and now, um, uh, you know, we're looking even to help um, settle um, people up, um, up north even a little bit more. So as we continue to look for places with affordable housing, um, to, to find, you um, furnishings, clothing, food, help them get um, any benefits that, that are, um, that they, that they're, that are available to um, asylees. Um, it's, uh, it seems like a good time for us to just step up as a community and acknowledge um, that there is a crisis at hand and that we are all working together to do our best to help, help these people um, find, find homes and, and, and again, uh, positively work into our communities and fit into our communities, feel comfortable here. Oh, so absolutely. I but um, I think we could also follow the examples of Neighbors Link and Padres Hispanos who, you know, been doing this work for other new arrivals for a while, and they might be able to, you know, also give some insight on how best to support new arrivals. And we have absolutely been working with Neighbors Link. Um, Hand, hand in hand, as well as open door and all of our community agencies. And that's why, you know, Austin is so um, one, one of many communities that's, that's well suited to um, help people settle because we know and have been doing this work for a very long time with our, with our um, immigrant populations. It is a little different, different when people are leaving um, countries um, as asylees and refugees um, during these types of crises, um, but it's only a little different. It's not lots and lots different, but they do come with a different set of circumstances through the U.S. government. Um, so oftentimes they are, um, you know, able to work very quickly, um, get working papers, get social security numbers and things of that nature, um, which is a little bit different than, um, unfortunately, our undocumented immigrant population. Not to say that, um, you know, again, that that we that we don't need to continue to support our our immigrant population because we absolutely do, and they absolutely are critical members of our community, add to the fabric of our society, and um, and you know, of course, we need all all you know need to raise all ships, and and that's what you know. Again, we're just acknowledging that with these recent refugee crises, that we also need to um, make room for for refugees as well. Any further discussion? Questions? No. All right, fantastic. So with that, um, I think I just need a motion to adjourn to executive session for advice of council and personnel. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with a legislative session, Tuesday, March 8th via Zoom. But it is likely that we will consider transitioning back to hybrid meetings by the end of March, um, which may coincide with the governor um, lifting the um, executive order or emergency order. Um, so hopefully we'll be the best of both world, worlds for the board, um, special guests and members of the public for participating um, in our meetings. So stay tuned for updates. We'll always post the locations and Zoom access information on our townofaustin.com website. So check it out. Thanks everybody and have a great night.